we're working our way through the book of Romans, and we're up to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, this is part 12. Does it really matter if Christians sin? We get grace, we're forgiven. Don't forget Wednesday night, everything starts up this Wednesday night. Supper at Cedarview, all the classes, all the groups meet. And then the prayer meeting at 7.45 for half an hour in the South Sanctuary. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? When you work your way through a book of the Bible, one of the things it does is it helps you learn how to study the Bible. And when you see what shall we say then, you know that Paul is linking up that question with something he's just said. And so your mind races back to Romans chapter 5, verse 20. The question in 6.1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? grew out of a point that Paul made in 520 where he says, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Now that's a simpler way of saying a very convoluted restatement of the same idea in 3, 5 to 8, where, where Paul gets more expansive in his argument, and he's almost hard to follow, where he says, but if our righteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, sorry, if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? Why would God judge us if our sin only manifests more and more of his righteousness? That's what he's saying there. Verse 6, by no means, for then how would God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? If I tell a lie and it just manifests more and more of God's grace, then why would God condemn me for being a liar? just gives him a chance to show his mercy. It just makes him look good. Verse 8, And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, and their condemnation is just. So here's the issue. The issue is, if God's grace shines all the more brightly where sin abounds, how much does it really matter if Sin abounds. What harm is done? What are the effects of sin in the life of a saint? And, and the fact that Paul, I just showed you a couple of places where he raises this issue, issue. He does it over and over again. And the fact that he repeats this thought several times, it, it shows that he has concerns about People misunderstanding grace and how it works in the life. Or, or to put it another way, if you want to use more theological terms, what is there any necessary relationship between justification, being saved, and sanctification, growing in holiness? Can you have one without the other? After all, you get grace, you get forgiveness. Glory to his name, there to my heart was the blood applied, washed in the blood, all those songs. I got saved, made clean. What else has to happen? Isn't that good enough? Can justification be present without any growth in holiness? I have three or four thoughts that I want to go through tonight looking at this subject, and it relates to baptism as well. Point number one, living an integrated Christian life. Look at Romans 6, verses 2 through 7. So this is, now he's just said, are we going to continue in sin that grace may abound? Okay. By no means, verse 2. How, how can we, who died 
to sin, still live in it. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were, we were, we were buried with him. You got those clear shots tonight with that camera up above the water. Buried with him. That's the idea. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now there's a sequence here. There's an order, right? For, verse 5, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died, the one who has died has been set free from sin. So the idea here is we, we are not to wait to the new creation, the return of Jesus, to start living like Christians. We, we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ, apart from any works of righteousness. But the reality of that faith, justifying faith, is manifested in the way we live day to day. That's the rub. We were justified by faith, past tense, so that the life of Jesus, Paul's words, might be manifested in our lives today, present tense. Notice something really important. The first thing Paul talks about in this new life in Christ Here's the way we present it. We go to the Gospels. um, Born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say to you, you must be born again. New birth. And that's true. But when you start looking at the process of how this works, the, the the first thing in the sequence isn't birth. Did you notice? The first thing in the sequence is death. Death and dying. Paul Paul keeps these Roman Christians to whom he writes from just emotionally withdrawing from this key idea of being, Romans 6.3, baptized into the death of Christ. Because he knows I'd much rather talk about eternal life He who has the Son has life, John 3.36. There, that's more like it. But how how does life come? How does it happen? What brings it about? And, And here's the striking revelation of this great text. The first step toward new life is becoming integrated with Christ's death. Not just knowing about it. Becoming integrated in Christ's death. That's in, that, that's in Romans 6. When you, when you look at 3 through 7, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, here's the first thing. If you're in Christ Jesus, you're baptized into his death. Step one. We were buried with him, with baptism, into death, In order that. So something follows that. That's what order means. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if, there's the if part, if we have been united with him in a death like his, that's the first step, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know, verse 6, that our old self was crucified with him 
in order that this body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Those are not light, breezy verses. Notice the way Paul puts it. We have been baptized into his death, verse 3. With him by baptism into death, verse 4. So it's, it's again, it's not just something known about. It's, it's not a concept. It's a participation. It's something you, you, you walk into, you step into. There's a, there's a participation in Christ's death. It's a kind of symbiosis by which we experience his death in our lives. Now that concept, here's what I'm, why I'm arguing tonight. This concept is so central to Paul's thinking, it explains many other strong passages in the New Testament. Passages like Galatians 2, uh, 19 and 20. I have been, I have been, and you can see the nails in Paul's hands. I have been crucified with Christ. It's, it's no longer I who live. It's gone. But Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by Faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Or, or 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might, here it is, die to sin. There's the, here's the order again. Die to sin, live to righteousness. Which comes first? Not living to righteousness. That's not what comes first. Dying to sin, that we might live to righteousness. By, by his wounds we have been healed. That's how this comes about. This healing process of our souls. 2 Corinthians 4. Paul writes. Again, strange words. Always carrying in the body. He's talking about his body. Here's what I carry around all the time. The death of Jesus. I carry the death of Jesus around. Striking, isn't it? You get up in the morning, shower, shave, do whatever you do. In addition to putting on your clothes, Paul says, here's what I do every day. I put on the death of Jesus. We would say the life of Jesus, wouldn't we? I get up every day and I put on the death of Jesus. It's not morbid. He's talking about how life will ultimately get manifested in his life. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. So each one is manifested. People see the death of Jesus in my life. And then they see the life of Jesus in these bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So all these verses, I'm saying move in the same direction. The experience of faith in Christ's death moves from just inward conviction to physiological expression in the body. It isn't just some mystical state. Paul labors that word, manifestation. That's why he talks about Christ being manifested in the life I now live in the flesh, Galatians. And the body of sin being brought to nothing, Romans 6, 6. Not letting sin reign in our mortal bodies, 6, 12. Carrying around the, in the body the death of Jesus, 1 Corinthians 4. It's very physical. The whole thing is very physical. It's very literal. You, you should be able to look at me and see areas of my life and see the death of Jesus in Don Horbin the way you see my hair turning gray. So it's visible. You can see it in different areas. You can spot it. The death of Jesus. Death to self. Now, I don't do that perfectly yet. You don't either. We do, at times, sin. It's not impossible for us to sin. 
But, but Paul's talking about, this is what we have to get, church. Paul is talking about the way we look at our lives. Here's, here's how we consider our present condition in this world. We have died to sin. What's that mean? Okay, I'm not going to sit and calculate how I can plan to sin. Not in any way. That means I don't sit and calculate how I can get even with someone who wrongs me. I don't do that anymore. Not if I'm following Jesus. I don't, I don't sit and plan how I can secure happiness in my life with material possessions. I used to do that. I'm dead to that now. I don't, I don't linger over sinful options anymore. I don't play with the edges of sin. I, when I think about my life, I don't do this perfectly. I get it. But when I think about my life, I consider all of that a part of my past life. That's what Paul's saying. And when I sin, it's only being haunted by something that's dead in the past. But I don't relish it anymore. I, I'm not going that way anymore. That's what, that's what Paul is saying. This has to be real. I consider sin something I am now dead toward. Sin, of course, is far from dead. He's not talking about that. He's not saying sin is dead in him. He's saying he is dead to sin. That's something different. Being in Christ, my concern is this. We've got a growing number of people in, I don't mean this church, I mean the church. We've got a growing number of people who when they consider being in Christ Jesus, think of blessings, they think of all sorts of things, and, and the death of Jesus being manifested in their life, it's, it's, not even a, it's not even on the radar anymore. I'm supposed to think of involvement in sin about as much as a corpse considers being involved playing baseball. It's not a part of it anymore. Okay, point number two. Baptism is an expression of my committed, I should have one more word in there, I, I didn't, committed, continual involvement in the death and life of Christ. That's what you witnessed tonight. It might not have been talked about all the time, but that's what you were witnessing. And we need to understand it, even if it doesn't get said all the time. Look at verses 3 and 4. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Do you, see, what you saw here tonight was three deaths. That's what we were watching tonight. It's not, oh, weren't they cute? Oh, how nice. No, three deaths. You watch three deaths up here tonight. And that has to be understood. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into, right into it, into his death? We, we were buried with him, therefore, by baptism into death. It's not negative, though. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. It is hard for us to imagine just how central baptism was to the conversion experience in the New Testament. Hard for us to imagine. We, we tend to minimize it. Some kind of optional um, religious ceremony we do in church. I noticed this morning, I saw the announcements on the screen, and one of them said, considering baptism, question mark, we're not going to use that anymore. That slide should say, be baptized right now. There's nothing optional about it. It's a part of following Jesus. That's the way it's constantly presented in God's word. Acts 2, 36 to 38. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. You get this marvelous sermon from Peter. 
this Jesus whom you crucified. Okay, so now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Wow. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? If this is true, what's the next step? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. How many of them? Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is Peter's declaration of the gospel on the day of Pentecost. You know what we would have said today? What shall we do? Every one of us, me, me included. We would have said, well, you need to accept Jesus. Isn't that what we'd say? You, I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to ask Jesus into your heart. And there's a subtle difference there. The difference is just you need to accept Jesus. You need to ask Jesus into your heart. It, it's like I need to add this. I need, to, I need to bring this, Jesus, I need to add it. Bring it into my life. Whereas what Peter says is, you, you, well, let me tell you what you have to do first. You've got to die. You have to repent. You don't start just adding something. You start deleting something. Repent, and you need to be baptized, Peter says. That's how you get going. There's, there was no way just to accept Christ without dying to self and repenting of sin. Why? Why is baptism so crucial in the theology of the salvation process in the New Testament? Well, only this reason. Only baptism makes clear what the Christian life is all about. Only, only baptism demonstrates the correct order of events. Only baptism reveals the obstetrics of the new birth. Baptism involves my stepping into the death and resurrection of Christ in that order. So, so I've said it before. Baptism is the inaugural act of repentance in the Christian life. Only baptism launches the rest of the Christian life in a direction that has any hope of being successful. Now you see why we say, you need to be baptized. Because, because if, if you're a Christian and you've not been baptized at all, you're, you're trying to live your Christian life based on the foundation of disobedience at the very beginning of it. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're trying to say, I want to give my life to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. But you've disobeyed him right out of the gate. And so only baptism launches the Christian life in a way that has success stamped on it. Baptism visualizes the kind of symbiosis into the death and life of Christ. In the act of baptism, I am not telling the church, I believe Christ died for me. In the act of baptism, I am stepping into my own death to sin so that the new life I profess has a chance to be manifested in my experience. So, so I'm trying to think of a way to say it that you'll remember so it's kind of striking. Every baptism is a kind of suicide. You'll remember that one. <laughs> it's this, it's stepping into a death to self. That's what the going down, being buried, we don't use dirt, but buried, submerged in the water, that, that's what it's all about. It isn't just proof of my orthodoxy. It's being engrafted, engrafting my life into Christ's death and then resurrection. There is real death to be experienced. You'll be... It changes the way you relate to your friends. It changes the way your views are going to be accepted by the culture around you. It changes the things they're going to say to you in that university class. It changes where you're going to go with which friends and what you're going to do when you get there. It changes the way you date. It changes your sexual morality. It changes the way you look at marriage. There is a real death to be experienced just as surely as there is 
real life to be received. To make the point with even greater intensity, notice that Paul, it's like he can't work this quite enough. He not only talks about dying with Christ, he takes it a step further. He, he goes beyond my death with Christ to my burial. Romans 6, 4, we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism. That's what baptism is. So, so not only does Paul describe this process of dying, he, he compares baptism with the very end of the process, burial. That's, it's, it's instructive. I've been, I've been to a lot of funerals. So have you. People get involved in services. There's bulletins. There's memorials. There's eulogies. There's funeral homes. There's lunches. There's cards. And then, and then the body is laid in the ground. People get back in their cars at the cemetery. And what makes the end of the process so hard for those loved ones left behind is, is, is it's the finality of that burial. Someone goes home to an empty house. That's what it means. Someone sleeps in a bed all alone for the first time where there used to be two. Breakfast is quiet used to be two people eating cornflakes. And the departed one is never coming back in this life. Why did I go through all that? Paul says, there, there. Paul says, that's it exactly. That's what has happened to your old life. It's dead and it's buried. It's really an instructive image. It, it means part of following Jesus is learning, like that departed loved one, it's learning how to live without them, right? Only we don't make the same link in coming to Christ. There's an old life, and it's a whole game now of learning to live without that life. It's not always easy. That's the best picture Paul can come up with under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's like, it's like something that was so close to you, like your own skin, and it's buried now. And now the job of sanctification is learning to live without it for the first time. That's the image Paul dwells on. I think it's impacting. Point number three, we're almost done. If you're sitting here thinking this sounds hard, this is how I want to wrap up. Only through a genuine participation of Christ's death is there any hope for new life, joy and new life. Look at verses 4 to 8 again, real quick. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. And then these words are full of hope. Underline them. In order that. So the death isn't an end in itself. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Paul says, I want you to get to newness of life, but there's no shortcut to it. You can't wish this on yourself. Verse 5, for if, there's the if word, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. New life. We know that our old self was crucified with him. Here's the same hope-filled words. In order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. You get to the place where you're sick of your sin. You don't want to live in it anymore. For the one who has died, verse 7, has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. Dying with Christ is only negative in terms of the old life of sin. God has something better. 
It's where you have to start. There is no other starting place, but it's not the end of the journey. The result of dying with Christ through baptism is newness of life, 6.4. Or verse 10, being alive unto God. I'm going to close. Let me tell you what I think is one of the greatest misconceptions of spiritual life. There are people... Who in their heart, this will never work. They want new life in Christ, but not as much as they want to keep some of their old life of sin. Did you get it? It will never work. It will never work. It's not that there isn't new life to be had, but there's a sequence to possessing it. You can't pray this new life into your soul. If I understand my Bible right, you can't study this new life into your soul. You can't become alive unto God, verse 10, through the work of any church or any preacher. You can't fast enough. You can't give enough. You can't receive it at an altar. All of those things have their place and their own importance. But in terms of becoming alive unto God and walking in new life, they will not get you there. You become alive unto God in only one way. You become alive unto God through becoming dead to something else. I can't tell you anything more important than that. If you don't know in a very practical sense, not a mystical sense, what it is like to dress yourself every day in the death of Christ, living for his glory rather than the praise of the crowd, you will never know what new life in Christ means. You'll read about it, you'll hear about it, you'll try and fake it, but you won't have it. The power of Christ cannot be pumped into your present life. The power of Christ cannot be pumped into your present life. When the branch gets engrafted into the vine, remember Jesus talked about it? It's not only the life of Christ that gets infused, it's his death as well. So when you ask Jesus into your heart, the first thing he will bring is the funeral for your old life. Baptism is the first sign of it. And it's the first step to becoming alive unto God, which is where we all want to end up. And everyone said... <laughs>